After much politicking at the United Nations Security Council, no consensus was reached on two resolutions on Syria. How will this impact the humanitarian situation in the war-torn country and put millions of lives at further risk? A year on from the resignation of Gotabaya Rajpaksha as President of Sri Lanka, we asked Prashant what's going on on the political and economic front in the island nation. What has changed and how? And 30 years after the People Power Revolution in the Philippines, has the country moved on from the long hangover of the Ferdinand Marcos dictatorship? First up, failure to come to an agreement on either of two competing resolutions at the UN Security Council on Tuesday has put at serious risk life-saving humanitarian assistance to millions of Syrians living through the war. The cross-border aid arrangement was operational since 2014 under the aegis of the United Nations, but permission for the border crossing at Bab al-Hawa ran out on Monday, leaving the entire mechanism, which brings food, medicine and other essentials uh, to Syria, uh, particularly a certain part of Syria, in serious jeopardy. Abdul is with us in studio uh, and covers the region for People's Dispatch. Uh, Abdul, tell us where exactly this aid was going, how many people are impacted by it and uh, then we'll get to, of course, the politics behind why these resolutions, this, this sort of agreement hasn't been extended. Well, uh, basically North, northern Syria, which is, uh, you can say, the last hub of the anti-Basar al-Assad forces, uh, particularly Idlib and the areas around it, which basically also has become much, the actual population was not that much, but because of the war for a decade, a large number of people have moved Been to that region. And so right. around 2.6 uh, uh, million people right. at this moment are dependent on it. There are, the actual population is larger, right. but uh, at least the, as per the UN data, around 2.6 million uh, Syrians living in this region are dependent on the aid provided by the UN. Uh, uh, most of these pe uh, people, as I said before, are uh, those who are dependent on that aid basically are from refugees from different yeah. other parts of Syria. Mm. But they are, the, the need of aid has increased rec recently, primarily after the earthquake in February, mm. which basically led to the uh, destruction of the houses, whatever houses uh, there were. There were. Mm. And a large number of people have been forced to live in tents. Mm. So everything uh, from the tent to the food and other things are provided right. by the United Nations and other aid agencies. Mm. Uh, so yeah, that is, these are, this is the primary uh, uh, subject uh, uh, which basically is impacted because of the uh, uh, not extension of the uh, cross-border aid uh, mechanism. Right. Uh, so, so what happened at the Security Council? There were two uh, competing resolutions, like we were saying, one put up by Russia and the other by the Western powers. Uh, what, what, were the, what were the sticking points and, and how come no consensus was reached, no middle ground was also found? See, in order to understand the basic sticking point, uh, one should understand the history of the war in Syria. Uh, when the war began, the US, other regional forces, were, uh, in, including Turkey, were supporting the, the anti basar al-Assad opposition, armed opposition. Mm. And uh, since uh, most of the territories of Syria is now under the control of Bashar al-Assad al government, and this particular region only is it's under not. the control of the forces which were primarily supported by the what we call in general West and Western uh, West's regional allies at the time. Mm. Uh, that then it becomes much more the the politics behind it becomes very clear. Mm. Syrian government is primarily trying to uh, push for reintegration of the region into the larger Syrian uh, Syria, and. Uh, uh, and uh, for that, it's basically saying that the cross, continuation of the cross-border uh, aid mechanism, it was necessary, it was uh, the way it was implemented few years back. Now it is not uh, necessary, given the fact that there is a, some kind of stability uh, has, uh, has been achieved. And if you continue to provide aid uh, this way for, across Turkey, You're it basically does two things. It basically prolongs the status quo mm. and prevents the uh, Syrian government's effort to end the war mm. in the country. Mm. And it also violates the international law, the sovereignty, sovereignty of the Syrian, Syrian government, right. uh, Syrian state. Uh, so these are the objections which has been uh, which have been raised by Syria time and again, mm. uh, and that was the reason that this, uh, the aid mechanism was only extended for six months, never for a year. Right. Uh, 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 
last time when it was extended in in january or february mm. the the conditions were that the whatever uh, uh, serious concerns are there will be an attempt to resolve yes. them mm. no uh, uh, progress have have been made on that and that's why syria and through its ally of course uh, russia Mm. which is a permanent member mm. has raised these issues and because there is russia sitting there the uh, the We us and other people uh, other countries western countries yeah. have been not able to push for uh, basically continuation what syrians are saying and that seems uh, is the re uh, mm. the logical conclusion mm. that they basically uh, do not want the resolution of the war basically want the continuation of the status quo mm. and that is the basic sticking point point If, if we just to uh, kind of give a brief thing, what happened? Yeah. Uh, uh, Russia wanted that uh, the extension for six months, as has been the practice. As has been the practice right. with with strong mechanisms in place mm. to address the Syrian These concerns. Mm. Uh, the, the the countries which vetoed it, mm. uh, United States, uh, 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 France, and UK. Mm. Uh, the resolution put by. Basically, Switzerland and Brazil, but backed by France, UK, and US, US, basically talks about nine months extension. Mm. Earlier, they were pushing for one year. Now it is uh, they they thought this is the compromise they are proposing: mm. nine months with no uh, uh, additional okay. mechanism to address the Syrian concern. Right. So uh, Russia was uh, very clear. The mm. Russian ambassador was uh, very clearly stated: if you if you are pushing for that kind of technical. Uh, extension we will Nothing not will. support it until the issues which are uh, serious issues hmm. addressed we will never support the extension of uh, the aid mechanism forgive me if i'm being reductive uh, here abdul but is it uh, an attempt or can it be viewed as an attempt then uh, given all the context you've given us uh, of uh, the west essentially trying to demonize or continue the process of demonizing russia as saying they are getting in the way of an agreement that will put lives at risk Exactly. Uh, that is exactly what is happening. If you read the statement made by the U.S. ambassador in the U.N. Uh, Security Council after the vote, vote, hmm. it basically clearly states that this is shameless, inhuman act done by Russians. Uh, they do not care about the millions of people who are dependent uh, on, on aid, aid and so on and so forth. But that is not the case. It is the U.S. primarily and the U.S. backed uh, U.S. allies, hmm. France and U.K., which have imposed sanctions. Hmm. Syria is also saying that if you remove the sanctions yeah. on us, that is also address the humanitarian concern, yeah, yeah. and we will be and and if you create a mechanism through, which basically dis, uh, creates possibility of cross uh, exchange of the aid with the rebel held area, held areas and the rest of the Syria, then we are ready uh, to extend it for hmm. next six months. Hmm. They are not ready to do it. So the entire attempt is basically this particular attempt is to portray Russia as. And Syria, of course, as a Bashar al-Assad government in Syria, mm. as some as those who are basically inhuman, they are not concerned about humanity. They have been killing their people, and so on and so forth. At as has been the campaign, not uh, uh, understanding the real concerns of the people mm. and the real concern of the Syria at large. Mm. And of course, the friends in the media are doing their best exactly. to help them build that narrative. Thanks very much for that uh, update, Abdul. A year ago, activists and citizens in Sri Lanka celebrated on the streets of the capital, Colombo, and across the country as President Gotabaya Rajapaksa put in his papers and resigned from the office. Uh, the powerful Rajapaksa family, though, is still very much in the political scene and have been rebuilding since those historic events a year ago. As the anniversary approached, Sri Lanka's Attorney General Sanjay Rajaratnam instructed the in Inspector General of Police to name 34 suspects in the case regarding the attack on peaceful protesters at Golface. Mahinda Rajpaksa nor his eldest son Namal, who have been accused by the protest movement of instigating the mob against them, are not on that list. Prashant is in studio now to discuss the political and economic situation one year on from what is known as the June 9 uprising. Uh, Prashant, so there is the first question. What is the situation on the ground? Right, uh, Siddhant. If you look at the, uh, if you look at Sri Lanka right now, I think uh, things are 
in a bit of a flux because on the one hand, uh, the severe economic crisis which marked a lot of last year has slightly abated. Mm. And I think there's, you know, there are more things on the uh, supermarkets are no longer empty as was the case at one point of time. There may not be very long queues waiting for fuel. Supplies may have restored to some extent. But there is also a greater immiseration of the people that has taken place, which is actually a result of this long-lasting crisis. So mm. that's, we'll come to the economic situation as well. But politically, what we see is that uh, there is uh, a government in place which has really lost a lot of credibility but which is uh, hanging on because the opposition on the one hand has not been able to come up with a very credible narrative mm. and on the other hand this government has through a lot of machinations been able to sustain itself as the uh, only alternative or something of that sort. Right. So, you know, that is really what has helped this government come to power. And we need to remember the context, which is that Gotabaya Rajapaksha and Rajapaksha and his family were, you know, really in charge of Sri Lanka last year. In fact, yeah. in the beginning of 2022, I think six members of the family were in government. Mm. Gotabaya was the president, his brother Mahinda Rajapaksha was the prime minister. There were other family members in key positions of power. In May 2022 and July 2022, what happens is that the Rajapaksha family is swept off from uh, the political chessboard, so to speak. Mm. But what really happens is that they do not vanish, and this mm -hmm. is very important. Mm. And they are able to prop up Ranil Vikramasinghe, the current president, mm. who uh, at that point had was just a single member. He was the only member of his party who was in parliament at had that no point of time. Had no legitimacy in that Yes, sense. and he, he first became uh, the acting prime minister and then became uh, the president as well. Mm. So uh, Vikramasinghe himself has, uh, the, basically his entire legitimacy or source of power is from the Rajapaksa. Uh, you know, power uh, base, uh, machine, so machine, to speak. Yeah, yeah. So while the Rajapaksas are not in power per se, they continue to exert a very powerful influence behind the scene. There's no real question about that. Mm. And secondly, Vikramasinghe has positioned himself as a kind of, you know, the only answer to uh, the economic problems of Sri Lanka. He's again championed the IMF loan mm. and the associated policies as the only way to sort of, you know, rescue Sri Lanka from this crisis. And because there is, I think, the... Uh, a difficult, uh, you know, not an entirely uh, the uh, presence of political alternatives has also not been tested mm. because while there are powerful forces on the ground in opposition, including the JVP, for instance, mm. there's no there's been no election to really sort of test that, including the I, I believe the local body elections which have not been held. Right. So you know, so that's also a key question, and which is why I think progressive sections and the left from the very beginning had kept saying that Vikramasinghe must resign because mm. he has no legitimacy mm. to become the president. Mm. And meanwhile, there's also been a lot of persecution of political opponents. Mm. We saw that with a lot of student activists who were arrested. And while the protests themselves have sort of uh, abated, you, know, you, don't, you don't see mass protests on the streets anymore. I think nonetheless, there's definitely a very strong underlying crisis that exists in Sri Lanka right now. Mm. And the question is that whether sections of the opposition can pro present and convince people of a credible enough alternative that they pose mm. uh, to sort of address these issues. Mm. So I think that's where we are, uh, you know, uh, say one year down the line, we have a government which is uh, and also has also enacted quite a few authoritarian provisions. Yeah. So there's definitely yeah. a strong turn to the right as well, and which really raises the question of how uh, you know this could be used as a moment for right wing forces to mobilize. Mm. From your assessment, Prashant, it seems very much like the government machinery is geared towards holding on to power first and then looking at the underlying factors behind the crisis second. Uh, and of course, the economy you touched on a little bit uh, is what will keep things on the boil. Uh, what do you have on that front? Uh, has Vikramasinghe even been able to sort of uh, put out the f on the face of it some kind of uh, possibility of change or is it just uh, fear of the same cycles of debt being just repeated? Oh, absolutely, it's the same because we've talked about this, we've had interviews on this in the past. The Sri Lankan, Sri Lanka has gone to the IMF innumerable number of times. Mm. I mean, I forget the number because uh, many countries, Sri Lanka, Ghana, all these countries yeah. are very similar yeah. numbers. So yeah. I think yeah. it's the 16th time, right. if I'm not mistaken, could yeah. be a bit here and there. But, uh, you know, and this, this time they've got, they, I think they're getting about 2.95 billion or something and it's really no different. I, IMF, the IMF loan comes with conditionalities of austerity. It comes with, you know, conditionalities of privatization and the government has gone all out to implement that. Mm. Now, it is a fact that maybe inflation has declined, mm. uh, you know, from I think in September it was around 70%. Mm. Now, it has definitely come down from that and like I said, maybe the supermarkets are back, goods are back on the supermarket but the fact is that people have suffered a vast amount of uh, immiseration and poverty as a result of this long crisis mm. and that is what often you don't measure except in say reporting that takes place or reports by UN agencies which right. chronicle say questions of hunger, how mm. many people are suffering, a large number of the percentage of the population struggling for food mm. etc. Mm. 
and also this might uh, the return of some of these goods might address some of the middle class constituencies yeah, who might yeah. no longer be this thing interested in protesting or it might uh, say address say some sections of workers who are you know who are relatively well off but for the poorer workers for the end of a larger working class in general this none does not really address the problem mm. and so their woes really go kind of unaddressed so the economic issues by no means resolved and they're probably unfortunately likely to get worse because sri lanka is going to use uh, it restores its balance of payments maybe but are uh, the uh, you know with austerity policies and with the kind of privatization we're seeing we are not going to see any sustainable uh, economic policy and there is no single economic policy that vikram singh has uh, proposed mm. which actually looks to sort of break out of this cycle that we often talked about on this show the cycle of debt austerity and then uh, returning back to the imf for more debt in some years so definitely uh, absolutely no and but i think there is also an issue in the sense of a lot of the mainstream political class including the main opposition mm. are also failing to provide those kind of alternatives Order. and have that dialogue yeah. leftist sections have presented alternatives of course but mm. the mainstream political elite remains as uh, bound within the IMF and Same these word. global finance bodies and these new and these policies of austerity as the only solution to this crisis so i think that's a very important issue that uh, the people in sri lanka the organized movements in sri lanka need to address as time passes as well maybe finally very quickly we can touch on since we've been talking so much about regional forums on the show in the recent past uh, any sort of uh, assistance or help uh, coming from uh, you know let's say india who's around the corner or other regional uh, bodies right so i think many of the country most of the country's interactions have pretty much been designed around you know restructuring loans for instance which actually provides the condition uh, pro- sets the ground for some of the imf assistance to come in mm. but uh, more other than that i don't see you know how much um, how much of that is really going to help because this is probably more of a while the crisis is always global mm. this is really fundamentally a political question for sri lanka sri itself lanka. to address it what model of development does it choose and from there stems the question of where do you get the necessary assistance right, right? so uh, if you are for instance Uh, bound or wedded to the IMF model, then the kind of assistance you're going to get is also pretty much based on those terms and conditions. So mm-hmm. I think that's also definitely, uh, you know, not really. I mean, while there has been, I think various countries have cooperated in various degrees to help Sri Lanka deal with some of these issues. Mm-hmm. India has provided aid, for instance. Aid. Mm-hmm. Sri Lankans have been quite positive about it. They mentioned it time and again. Mm-hmm. But I think it does not really address the larger question, which right. is that you know, band aids in that exactly, sense. exactly. All right. Thanks very much, Prashant, for that update. Another anniversary rounds up our lineup on the show today. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. in the Philippines has completed a little over a year uh, in charge of the country. He is, of course, the son of former dictator Ferdinand Marcos. Uh, in that time, a recent report has indicated that over 300 people have been killed in an, in an ongoing war uh, on drugs in the country. This is, of course, a legacy of the previous Duterte administration, uh, and most of the killings, it seems. Uh, are uh, at the hands of police and other state forces uh, anish covers the region for people's dispatch and joins us now via video conference for more uh, anish first up uh, give us the gist of this report and uh, and your reading of it of course well the report uh, is quite significant in that it is one of the uh, most comprehensive independent uh, documentation of uh, drug war killings Dahas has been doing it for a while now, and uh, the numbers actually is also quite revealing. It's uh, it says about three hundred and forty two drug related killings have have happened in uh, the first year of uh, uh, Marcos administration, Marcos Junior administration, and uh, this is no different from uh, uh, killings that happened under the Duterte administration. Maybe slightly lesser, but it's not that significantly different. Uh, uh what is sign uh, what is important to note is that about uh, 115 of these drug uh, and uh, you know drug war killings or drug illegal drug related killings uh, mm-hmm. in the philippines were conducted by illegal police operations uh, the numbers would increase to 146 if we count uh, the number of uh, police raids that actually killed people and then uh, those cases uh, those raids were later linked to uh, illegal drugs operations uh so basically there is a whole set of uh, uh impunity for these killings we have seen like there used to be uh, this is not just uh something that we're seeing uh as a continuation of the legacy we're also seeing a significant amount of opacity under the 
uh, the uh, sorry the Marcos Jr. Okay. administration because uh, if you look at the the government's re uh, response to these uh, numbers, they're saying that only five a total of five were killed in illegal uh, raids. So they are just try they're trying to downplay the numbers. We know it's not five for sure because we have reported uh, multiple killings uh, of uh, illegal uh, uh, raids in Philippines and it's like more than five, obviously. So uh, there is definitely some level of uh, uh, opacity, not some level, it's like a significant level of opacity uh, in the number of killings. At the very least, Duterte administration had uh, numbers, uh, at least of the legal operations that have that they have conducted and the number of killings, um, you know, public. But in the current regime, we do not see the same level of documentation happening. So it's, it depends on uh, independent uh, groups, independent organizations, uh, human rights groups to actually document them. Most of the time, it's not as comprehensive because obviously there have been multiple levels of uh, police violence across the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, and not just police violence, but also uh, violence by military operations, uh, which, uh, you know, which very often coincide with both anti-drug and anti so-called anti-terrorism operations. So uh, in many of these cases, the details are quite hazy. Very many times we have also reported how uh, the narrative is also completely changed, uh, you know, com completely in contradiction to the existing evidence of these murders. And uh, and obviously, the uh, the current administration is continuing uh, the previous administration's uh, policy of not allowing international observers, be it, uni be it the United Nations or the ICC or any kind of uh, international observers to actually conduct a uh, comprehensive report on the matter. So this is uh, where we are at in the Philippines, where you actually see impunity being significantly blown out. But it's not surprising because obviously the Duterte administration started out uh, by saying that they will continue uh, these operations. And probably like there was even there were even statements by ministers of the government that said that they would actually uh, multiply the forces uh, being employed uh, in these operations. Many mm. times it's not necessarily even the police. We have seen uh, multiple operations where uh, non-state actors who uh, act in concert with the police, vigilante groups who have been taken up by the police, uh, conducting uh, some of the raids, some of the uh, murders that they have seen, that we have seen and reported. And uh, in all of these, uh, you know, even in those cases, you do not have any kind of uh, uh, anybody taking responsibility, anybody being uh, held culpable or any level of attempt to uh, even bring uh, the killers to justice. Because obviously, mm -hmm. on paper, uh, you're not supposed to kill even people who are, uh, you know, who have been caught uh, selling yeah, drugs. Defying the drug law. Yeah. Exactly. Under the drug, even the, under the current uh, drug laws, uh, until and unless they are proved uh, with the uh, you know absolute the court uh, might certainty. sentence them to that sort of punishment. Exactly, but, yeah. and uh, even in that, like uh, the fact that there are a large number of people being killed and the level of uh, investigation or you know uh, the level of uh, uh, responsibility taken by any of the groups is quite uh, small, uh, is quite significantly lesser than what should have been the case. Hmm. Uh, Anish, uh, again quickly, just to round up, uh, as we've seen in these kind of, in the playbook on these kind of wars on drugs, uh, it's often uh, the, the most marginalized section of society that uh, ends up uh, paying the price and often, like you have pointed out, with their lives. Uh, we've seen it, of course, in the United States and its action uh, back in the day. Uh, it's currently happening in some way uh, in India, where in one part, a uh, particular community has been villainized in the same way, uh, you know, in the context of a war on drugs. Uh, is it similar in the Philippines? Uh, how, how, how do we look at the rationale of the government in continuing uh, with this campaign? Well, yeah, it is quite similar because uh, if you look at the, the predecessor of this nationwide war on drugs, which was uh, what happened uh, kept happening in Davos uh, under both Duterte, uh, both Rodrigo Duterte and his family members who uh, held the mayorship of the city. Uh, they even had uh, uh, the Davos Killing Squad, which was basically a group of vigilante people hired by the state 
by the local administration to actually hunt, so, so supposedly hunt down uh, people who were peddling illegal drugs. Uh, it actually ended up killing a large number of people, hundreds, in fact, uh, no, thousands, in fact, uh, according to certain estimates. So this was a playbook, and most of it was basically taken from uh, the U.S. Uh, war on drugs and, uh, you know, the kind of impunity that we're given. You see all the narrative being played out. All of that is pretty much the same. There is very little difference on that matter. And very often, uh, apart from the fact that it is obviously affecting the most marginalized people, who uh, even uh, you know people who are suffering from addiction who needs treatment rather than uh, you know being criminalized, Violence. obviously, yeah. uh, the, uh, you also have civil society being affected by uh, this violence. And very often, uh, there are plenty of cases where uh, independent journalists, radio journalists, uh, uh, rights activists even, who have been advocating against the killings and who have been calling for uh, people to be brought to justice, uh, many of them being targeted by vigilante groups in, uh, in you know, uh, killed in cold murder. Many times, it, uh, as we saw with the Percy Lapid killings, uh, we have reported it multiple times of uh, how uh, the police uh, administration, the uh, you know the jail, uh, the prison system, and obviously the drug lords uh, yeah. are all uh, working in cahoots to actually uh, you know hunt down activists, journalists to expose uh, these crimes, who actually bring uh, significant attention to it, mm. significant public attention to these matters. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this, obviously, the effect is something that is felt by pretty much every uh, levels of civil society, even up to the government, uh, where it is a matter of corruption. Obviously, the opacity uh, breeds corruption. It breeds uh, the kind of uh, a nexus between and very ironically between the drug lords and the police administration. And that is pretty much something that is not talked about and will never be talked about under you know the current dispensation. And uh, this is pretty much the uh, setup that we are looking at even. And it is continuing. Obviously, it is continuing with the numbers that we are looking at at the point. All right. Thank you very much for that update uh, from the Philippines. And with that, we bring to a close this episode of Daily Debrief. As always, we invite you to head to our website peoplesdispatch.org for more details on Anisha's work as well as what our uh, others, other reporters file from around the world on stories that matter to uh, people like you and I. Uh, also, don't forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back, of course, with another episode, same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.